Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. This is the France 24 debate. Is it time to talk between Washington, the West, and Iran? Uh, we've been talking about it uh, with our panel, Nushabe Amiri, editor of the uh, Farsi language news website, ruzonline.com. Also with us from Ranana, Israel, Eli Carmon of uh, IDC Herzliya's Institute for Counterterrorism, Patrick Clausen of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and French political scientist uh, Didier Chaudet. Welcome back uh, to all of you. Now, um, we were talking just before the break with Elie Carmon about the skepticism uh, of uh, the uh, Israelis uh, going into that UN annual assembly where the leaders will all make speeches, um, the easing off on airstrikes against Syria, also sparking disappointment and concern on the part of the Israeli cabinet. The determination the international community shows regarding Syria will have a direct impact on the Syrian regime's patron, Iran. Iran must understand the consequences of its continual defiance of the international community by its uh, pursuit towards nuclear weapons. Patrick Clausen, um to what extent uh, will the words of Netanyahu weigh on what and the Americans decide when it comes to the Iranians next week in New York? Well, the attitude that he was just expressing is widely shared here in the United States. And so uh, Netanyahu's uh, views are, are uh, so widely shared in Congress in particular, but also among the American public, uh, that there's a deep skepticism uh, about an agreement with Iran. Uh, for one thing, the agreements that uh, France, Britain, and Germany worked out with Iran 10 years ago were respected by Iran for only a short period. And within, a, within less than two years, Iran was back doing a full bore with its nuclear program. Uh, so there is skepticism that even if an agreement is reached, it will be implemented on a sustained basis. And, and that is one of the reasons why the uh, United States and Iran are discussing some confidence-building measures as a first step in any kind of an agreement, so that each of the two sides, which is distrustful of the other side, can have more confidence in the other uh, before we proceed to uh, the more um, bolder steps uh, of a full agreement. All right, but you uh, obviously it's impossible, and I'll put this to Didier Chaudet, it's impossible to keep the nuclear uh, uh, conversation separate from the Syria conversation. And what we've seen in the past months, Didier, is how um, the uh, Iranian-backed movement, Hezbollah, tipped the scales in the Battle of Qusair inside of Syria. And uh, there are um, Iranian um, uh, military observers, and more than observers, uh, helping uh, the regime of Bashar al-Assad. Um, is it a question of blowing hot and cold, or could all that evolve change on the part of the Iranians. And from an Iranian point of view, when you look at Syria, it's all about supporting one of their oldest ally. And beside that, they do understand that if Bashar al-Assad is falling, the people who could take over are extremist Sunni jihadists who are not really well open to democracy and even less toward minorities, of the Alawite included. Uh, the fact that we uh, combine nuclear, the nuclear issue and Syria just, just, is just showing that at the end of the day what is going on in Syria is not a question of the humanitarian uh, uh, in one hand and the pro-Iranian on the other side. It's more a question of geopolitics. It's all about, what, like, like it was said in some uh, English and American newspapers not so long ago, uh, the question of Israel versus Iran. Of course, a lot of things are going on that are linked to internal Syrian politics. But of course, the Iranians are supporting the Bashar al-Assad and have been helping the, to create a, 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 a militia there that is the Jaish al-Shabi. But in, a, in the other hand, you have Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and other states, including Western states, who have no problem letting Sunni jihadists coming to Syria. So here we are in a battle of geopolitics, nothing more, and uh, there, is no, uh, there is no morality here. Uh, as uh, sadly, uh, it is sad to say, but at the end of the day, it's just a battle of, uh, of power. 
Right, a battle of power, uh, uh, sort of a proxy in a way between uh, uh, I Iran and the West and Iran and Israel. But Eli Carmon, let me ask you, because we've heard the Israeli ambassador to the United States uh, say that Assad has to go. Uh, but that fear of the power vacuum and of all those radical Sunnis uh, taking over, uh, isn't that something that's present as well in Israel? I think uh, Assad was, uh, he was also a dangerous uh, uh, president and uh, partner in the sense that he uh, used Hezbollah and the Palestinian uh, radical organizations for 30 years to fight Israel as proxies. Uh, and we don't know how the situation indeed in Syria will, will finish. From the Iranian point of view, it is clearly the fall of uh, Bashar uh, al-Assad regime is a huge catastrophe, because uh, not only he loses the only uh, Arab ally in the Middle East, he weakens uh, extremely the Hezbollah in Lebanon, which is the only success of the export of the revolution by the Khomeini's doctrine, and can influence, by the way, uh, also the situation in Iraq uh, and the strength of the uh, Shia government there and it will uh, strengthen the position of uh, two important countries, Turkey and Saudi Arabia, which are uh, enemies or uh, uh, opponents of the Iranian regime. So uh, the situation in Syria is indeed very, very important for the uh, Iranian uh, regime and uh, actually for the situation, I, I would say even for the internal situation, because the fall of uh, Assad could perhaps uh, move some, something internally in, in Iran itself. All right, let, we can now welcome to this conversation, uh, uh, he was a candidate in Iran's presidential election. Uh, Hushang Amir Hamadi uh, teaches at Rutgers University, he joins us from uh, New Brunswick, uh, New Jersey. Uh, th thank you for being with us. Um, uh, do you agree, uh, Hushang, that it's uh, no going back for Iran's support for Syria? No, I don't agree. I think uh, Iran is prepared to make a, a major compromise over Syria. After all, Iran itself is in trouble with the Western powers, the U.S. in particular, as well as Israel, and, uh, and not to mention of Saudi Arabia. So Iran understands its limits. And second, I think Iran is prepared to forego Assad as a person. But I think Iran will not, of course, uh, go for a total submission of the present government to elements that are fighting it, and particularly the, the Wahhabi uh, Sunnis, including the uh, you know, Al-Qaeda and, and so on. So Iran is very nervous and concerned about them. So if the West was to uh, really uh, make a deal over Syria, in the following way, that Assad go, and then the rest of the Assad forces plus some of the major uh, parts of the opposition could come together in a general election or in a, uh, in a made-up coalition government, uh, then I think Iran will accept it. So what I'm saying is that Iran is prepared to, to let Assad go, and after all, they understand that Assad is saying it's going to be impossible almost impossible. And I also think that the Assad uh, family has been long enough around, and you know, they have been around for a long time. It's time uh, for a change in Syria. Uh, it's only unfortunate that this family should shift its dominance so long and mm. until it comes to a particular situation. So the Assad has to go. Iran also has no problem with that statement. But who replaces Assad is a major issue and I think the West, uh, all of the parties involved, from the West to uh, the Arab world and Iran, they could come together over a coalition government that replaces Assad and keeps the country, uh, country's integrity and well-being, uh, you know, preserved and, and uh, for a better future for the, 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 the Syrian people. And there are millions of people that have to return to their homeland, after all. Uh, there are right. over four million. I let me let me bring let me bring Patrick Clausen in on this. Patrick, do you agree that uh, uh, Iranians, the Iran, would be prepared to forego Assad as a person, as uh, Hussein has just said? Well, I think the more important point of uh, recent developments is the United States has shown that it is prepared to, to in fact, do a deal with uh, the Assad regime over chemical weapons and ignore all the other differences. And that uh, suggests that the United States would do the same with Iran, which is to say, do a deal over the nuclear issue and ignore all the other differences. 
so that that it, the United States may well be prepared to have a quite a limited deal with Iran, which ignores all these other issues like Syria or our differences about Afghanistan, uh, and just concentrates on the one question of the weapons of mass destruction. That's not something that Iran has expected from the United States. The, Iran has been afraid that the United States, especially the Supreme Leader, has been afraid that the United States was using the nuclear issue uh, as uh, one excuse to go after the Islamic Republic. And if the nuclear issue was settled, the West would then turn to other excuses to go after the Islamic Republic. Well, what Obama has shown is that, no, actually, Washington is prepared to do a deal which is just about weapons of mass destruction and ignore everything else, absolutely everything else. All right. So, by the way, on, on the issue of Iran's involvement inside of Syria, a lot of talk about uh, uh, images that have been coming out from Syria. Dutch television uh, broadcasting a report that includes footage brought out of Syria. It appears to be filmed by an Iranian crew. Uh, how that footage uh, got to the uh, uh, Dutch television is another matter. It includes, at one point, an interview with an Iranian military observer. دولت سوریه در مقابل مردم سوریه است نه چنین چیزی نیست یعنی خیلی از مردم هم این اعتقاد دارن که جبهه الان سوریه جبهه اسلام در مقابل کفره جبهه حق در مقابل باطله چرا که ما عقیده مونه که جبهه اینور حقا به این جهت که جبهه اینور مدافعش حضرت آقاست جبهه اینور مدافعش سید حسن نصرالله است جبهه اینور بچه ایران هستن حزب الله هستش مجاهدین عراقی هستن و جاهای دیگه مجاهدین افغانی هستن اینا اومدن جبه اون ور کیه اسرائیل جبه اون ور کیه عربستان هست جبه اون ور کیه ترکیه هست جبه اون ور کیه قطر پول های اماراتی هستش که good versus evil good versus non believers that an iranian general military advisor to the syrian army that footage by the way sparking this denial earlier today in tehran we have no official military presence in syria whatsoever Therefore, if there is a video or other propaganda, it should be considered in a different framework. Nushabi Amiri, uh, what, is, what is the reaction to this footage that's been coming out, that you've seen? Uh, as an Iranian or uh, what, the, the, the people who are in the face? How do Iranians feel about their country's involvement inside of Most Syria? Most of them are ashamed of that, especially after all this bloodshed in, uh, in uh, Syria. And they have said that uh, it's the f so many year, uh, years that they have said that we are not there, but we know that they are there. And last uh, month, one of the, the commander of this uh, Revolutionary Guard, they, they said officially that we are there, and they said that uh, Syria is more important than Khuzestan, one of the provinces of Iran. Uh, as an Iranian, really, I have contacted so many people, the student, the journalists, and everybody. They are really ashamed. Or probably because we don't, I don't have any contact with these sort of Hezbollah, because they don't want to have any con contact. But Iranian, no, they are not happy about that. H Hussein Amir Hamadi, are you ashamed? Yes, I am here. Uh, no, it's not that it's more of ashamed. I think it is just disappointment or opposition is the best word. Uh, it's not ashamed. Uh, in Iran, you no understand that. But the tech countries, that countries do fight each other, the forces are against. Remember, there are two Irans. There is an Iran that is revolutionary, is still revolutionary, is led by Ayatollah Khamenei, the leader, and it is controlled by the military and security forces and many other religious and non-religious institutions. And then there is the second Iran, that includes um, the majority of the Iranian people plus the government. The government, I mean the government, not the state, the Mr. Rouhani uh, and, and other people. And this Iran is much, much more moderate, uh, is much more cautious and uh, more pragmatic, and it's not revolutionary in a sense. And therefore, this second Iran doesn't want involvement in areas where it is none of their business, sort of. And they wanted that money that. Uh, is used at home for the uh, employment of the young people, for bringing the inflation down, bringing food up, and so on. And so again, there is a small Iran, however, a 10 percent, 15, maybe even 20 percent Iran, that is still supports that revolutionary idea that is involved in Syria, that is involved in Hezbollah business and in Hamas business and everybody else. And they are not at all ashamed. They are not even disappointed. They are the people who wanted to 
uh, expand Iran's quote unquote power beyond the, their homeland and into the region. So that Iran exists. But then, they, as I said, that exists in uh, contradiction to the second Iran that is more moderate, more pragmatic. And this Iran, in terms of the size, is larger, but in terms of power, is it smaller. All right, larger, but, but smaller in terms of power. Um, you were sort of flies in the face of what you said earlier, Didier, which was that when it comes to foreign policy, Iranians tend to be um, nationalistic. You can be nationalistic, and at the same time, you can have a good heart, you can be humanitarian, and you, you cannot really accept to support bloodshed, violence, and things like that. There is a difference between the morality of a private citizen and the morality of a man of state. It has always been like that. It has been explained in Europe in a little good book called The Prince of Machiavelli. It is sad to say, but it is how politics work. Besides that, the thing that I found really interesting is that we are asking uh, our Iranian friends, are you ashamed about Hezbollah? Are we ashamed ourselves about supporting an opposition to Assad, which is now strongly uh, jihadist, which has gonna, been called I, I, to Al-Qaeda? I was going to say, mm. uh, when, when the uprising began, civilians echoed uh, demands of uh, civil liberties that were heard throughout the Arab world as the conflict has grown more militarized. Um, the uh, power vacuum has been filled uh, by hardliners, and Syria has become, uh, you could say, the battleground for radicals on, on both sides of an old Sunni-Shia divide. The, the, definitely, Does that reflect mm, public opinion? And pu public uh, opinion to uh, uh, Public opinion Iran throughout the region, I would not say. For, uh, for, uh, in, the, in the region, broadly speaking, and you can go as far as uh, Afghanistan and, and, and Pakistan, you have this feeling that it is more and more Sunni against Shia situation. But like that same, general said in that clip we saw, this is a God versus the non-believers. Exactly, but you, you will have also people in the other side, in the Sunni side, saying exactly the same thing. The footage is very interesting. We will have to see if it's a genuine one or not. We need to be very careful in the Middle East about this kind of proof appearing all of a sudden. We, uh, which uh, This is a very good proof after weeks of talking about all these uh, jihadist actors being more and more important. The fact and the matter is that the West has a big responsibility on the way things have been evolving in Syria. We should have support the moderates at the beginning. We should have support the one talking about civil liberties and uh, in a way that was uh, that could have helped Syria democratize. We let them down, and now the only people who are fighting and who are holding the ground, 70% of the ground uh, t taken by the rebel, is in fact taken by jihadists or by people close to them. All right, let me, Patrick Clausen, we've done a lot of discussing about Syria on this set over the last month. And uh, when it came to Syria, we were. Everybody described this sort of maelstrom, this descent into this horrible, uh, extremist, intolerant view of, 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 these, of these fighters who are occupying a political vacuum. So on the one hand, you have this very dark situation in Syria. And here we've had a discussion the whole hour uh, trying to point to perhaps positive signs between Iran and the West. And so it's, it, the two are contradictory, no? Well, the, one of the unfortunate realities is that uh, it's more likely that the West can reach a nuclear deal with the Islamic Republic of Iran if the West uh, agrees that it will not support civil liberties and democracy inside Iran. And that uh, the developments over the last month in Syria, uh, sad as they are, certainly suggest that there is limited enthusiasm in, uh, in the West for supporting uh, those who are more moderate and fighting for civil liberties inside Syria. So this may suggest to the Iranian government, uh, well, actually, we could do a deal with the West, because the West will leave the Islamic Republic in power just so long as the Islamic Republic agrees to compromise about its nuclear weapons, and the West will ignore issues about democracy and human rights uh, in Iran. Uh, that's, I don't think, good for the Iranian people. I don't think it's good for the West's interests. Uh, but uh, it makes a, a possible deal over the nuclear issue easier to reach. Uh, ignoring could prove uh, more and more difficult. And I guess I'll put this question to, to Eli Carmon. When you see, for instance, uh, the sectarian violence spiking dramatically in Iraq, 
um, when you see not just Syria, the, uh, where there is a lot of violence on a, on, on a daily basis, uh, uh, how long uh, can the West, can Israel s sort of stand on the sidelines to, uh, while Sunnis and Shia radicals uh, fight each other? I think if you look uh, strategically to the region, uh, uh, the main conflict is the conflict between the Sunni and the Shiites. The radicals, but also if you want the moderates, because even mm -hmm. Turkey, for instance, is involved in this uh, fight. Inside this uh, main conflict, you have uh, very sectarian conflicts. For instance, the Kurds, uh, the Alawis, uh, and uh, the Baluchis, uh, if you want, in Iran and in Pakistan. So it's a very complicated and complex situation. But I would like to remember the, uh, my colleagues that uh, the uh, uh, opposition or the uh, up uprising in Syria began uh, peacefully. But the regime, uh, with its uh, massacre and uh, brutality, brought the radicalization uh, and uh, uh, jihadization, if you want, of the situation. And Iran uh, has some uh, uh, role in this because they supported from the beginning the uh, Assad regime. Uh, so it's a very complex situation. And because so many actors are involved and the stakes are very high, I think it's very difficult now. My opinion is it's very difficult to reunite uh, Syria. And that's why I think that uh, Iranians and uh, the Alawites, not uh, the Bashar Assad and his family, but the Alawites are preparing also a worst-case scenario for an Alawite state in case that they will be defeated. So we don't know exactly if uh, this uh, uh, conflict will not be, bring a balkanization of the Middle East, and this includes Syria, this includes uh, Iraq, and possibly even Turkey with the Kurdish uh, huge problem. All right, so a possible balkanization like we saw uh, in the former Yugoslavia at the end of the 1990s. Um, very briefly, Nushabe Amiri, um, y your thoughts on just re reacting to that issue that the, the push for democracy could get thrown overboard in all of this? Thrown uh, overboard? Which board? I, I, I didn't get your question. Uh, do, you, do you agree that uh, the push to for democracy inside Iran will get thrown overboard? No, never. Okay. We'll leave it there. Nushabe Amiri, I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, Hushang Amir Hamadi for joining us from New Brunswick, New Jersey, from Washington, D.C., Patrick Kloss and Eli Carmon um, from Manana, Israel, and uh, as well Didier Chaudet. Before we go, though, there's one aspect of this story that we haven't uh, talked about so far. I'm gonna, we're going to say hello at this point to James Creedon. James, you, Francois. Um, it was about 24 hours ago. Uh, we were suddenly getting tweets from inside of Iran saying, hey, the filters that uh, keep uh, Facebook and Twitter uh, censored uh, have been lifted. And there was this uh, sort of uh, flurry of activity. Flurry of activity. Yeah. And, and, and then we got a statement saying from the authorities saying, no, it was a technical glitch. So have you been able to well, it's, sift it's, through this a bit? It's a bit, of a, it's a bit of a mystery still exactly what happened. But just to show you some of what was we were seeing online in the last mm -hmm. 24 hours, Twitter and Facebook returned to Iran. Uh, you had uh, tweets coming out such as this one by a guy called Kaveh Pajuhan, my first legal tweet from Iran, right? But then if you click on his account, you can see that uh, he hasn't tweeted since then. So it looks like things went back to their, right, to their uh, original situation, which is Facebook and Twitter are inaccessible unless you use proxies or complicated means of getting around which a lot of people do. Now, um, you did have quite a few people wondering, is this a, a fight between hardliners and moderates, the fact that it suddenly became available and then it disappeared very quickly afterwards? For example, uh, the new uh, president of uh, Iran has a Twitter and a Facebook account, as does the Supreme Leader, as does the Foreign Minister. And indeed, some have said uh, that, uh, uh, that Hassan Rouhani is uh, promising to free up the internet eventually, while other hardliners, such as, here goes, Golam Hossein Mosseini Ejehi, who is Iran's uh, head of the supervisory board of the internet, uh, he is very much against uh, uh, lifting those, ba those sort of uh, filters, and he told AP recently it's not time for lifting them. So could it have been a battle between moderates and hardliners? Well, one uh, journalist told uh, France 24, in fact, that that's not the case. Uh, Arshad Alajani, who is uh, an Iranian journalist for France 24, spoke to journalists in Tehran, close to the regime, who said, absolutely not, this was a case of a technical problem. Now, what could so the explanation be? Too much into this, what now. could the explanation be? Apparently, Google Plus is now in inaccessible for some people in Tehran, according to sources who spoke to France 24 journalists. So it could be that they were updating 
the firewall, updating those systems of uh, blockages, etc. And in that process of updating uh, the firewall, things they became the door open. right. They left the door open. So that seems to be perhaps the most likely explanation. All right, James Creedon, I know you'll continue to follow sure. us. I want to thank you. I want to thank our panel, and we want to thank you for joining us here for the France Vanquette debate.